just on the main line of that song, kind of the same thing there. You know, every or an encouragement is found in it. Every every day that you live your life, you're one day closer to God in a sense, and that you're going to stand before Him. And so it only makes sense then to spend this time drawing near to God, uh, so that you're ready for that day. It'd be a good thing. Well, we're gonna we're gonna honor our moms today, and we have a we have a flower for you. Now, I think down through the years, we've always had like, okay, if you're the youngest one here of your moms or the oldest one, sometimes we'll do come up and get a flower for your mom and take it to your mom. I don't think we've ever done like the middle child. That's, that's typical, right? The middle kid always gets left out of those things. But, but um, so we're, we're going to do the middle kid. If you're the middle kid here today and you've got a mom here in the service, we're going to start with you. You come up and, and pick out a flower to take to your mom. And then, and then we're going to have all the, all the littles. So if you're like, oh, I don't know, third grade or younger and want to help hand out flowers, because we have lots of moms in the service who don't have a kid here. If you're not the middle child, but you do have a mom here and the middle one's not here, then you become the middle child today. So you, you come up and get a, a flower for your mom. Well, ready to go. I don't see anybody moving. <laughs> Christian here, middle kid? Huh? All right, good. You're what? <laughs> ah, that's good. Okay, go, Asher. Come here. You want to go help take him to some people? Oh, he already did. He's waiting to help. <laughs> She's already got one. Oh, I do. No. Oh, yeah. Scarlet, put three of them there. Oh, Scarlet already took your job, I think. <laughs> I might be wrong. She took three. <laughs> All right, so we need some help. So Asher, Justice, you guys want to come up and hand out flowers? Come on, you know what to do. Get a flower and go give it to a mom. Raise your hand if you don't have a flower yet and you're a mom, if you would. Please see all those hands. Go give them a flower. All right, come get another one. Hurry up. Mally. How many up there, Harry? Any more in the balcony other than Harry? He's on a mission.
Oh, they're over here now, Asher. All right, do we have any do we have any moms left that didn't get one yet? Okay. <clears throat> Take it out there. Asher. 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 Go out that way. We'll give one to Heather. <clears throat> left. <laughs> He'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a few uh, we're going to take a few moments and and just recognize our moms. If you got uh, something that comes to mind when you think of your mom or something that you're appreciative of, we'll take a a few opportunities to uh, celebrate them today. So, what do you think of when you think of your mom? <clears throat> Selfless. 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 Definitely, when I think of my mom, there's. That's the position in the family that sacrifices a lot for every other position in the family, doesn't it? Janessa. Timely. Timely. What do you mean by that? Making sure you make it on time. Okay. <laughs> I thought that would be at least part of it, probably. <laughs> Who else? What do you want to say about your mom this morning? Ari. My mom was always my biggest fan. That's awesome. Matt. My mom was tougher than nails. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good quality in a mom. I remember my mom shocked me a few times with her toughness. Well, just when I needed it, too. Travis. That's good. Kathy. My mom was a mama bear. Oh. You know, I mean, she was to break it after us, but we touched her kids. What was the best Yeah. Yep. She always provided the needs. For sure. Carter. I think just how loving my mom is. Just her, not just her family, but everybody. Yep, for sure. Angie. My mom has always been very giving and giving. I think there's a reason there's uh, one word is in the other word there. Don't you? Yep, that's very good. That she is. Yep. For sure. Be careful how much you move your hand. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah, good. Well, there's a lot, a lot wrapped up into being a mom, isn't there? Lots of qualities that we can go to and, and think of. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments praying, praying for our moms here this morning. Our Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here today in, in your presence and in the presence of one another. We're thankful for the opportunity to take a few moments to celebrate our moms and to just to think about what they mean to us. And, and Father, we're uh, we're grateful for them. There's some, there's some qualities that you built into into motherhood that are, that are just uh, well. Every child needs those as they're growing up, and and adults even as we're older. And uh, and God, we just we just thank you so much for our moms. Thank you for their their self sacrifice and their um, just the way they they watch over us, provide for us, take care of us, um, root for us. Um, Lord, just so many things. And we are, we are very grateful for them. Father, when we consider the family, as much as, as there are forces at work within our society, as has been every society down through the ages, to uh, diminish and to tear apart the family, Lord, we recognize the wisdom of God within the family. And so, Father, we just uh, pray that our society would, 
I would always see the family as the anchor of society and the, the foundation, the bedrock of, of, uh, of raising the next generation. And uh, uh, not so much, and take a village, it takes family. And so, Father, we just, we're just thankful for that. And, Father, we just uh, pray for your blessing up, upon moms. We pray that uh, for those are, especially that are still in the thick of, of raising kids and impacting grandkids and everything, that you would just give them the strength and encouragement uh, to keep it up because it undoubtedly takes a lot of energy. And, Father, we are uh, very grateful for their influence and impact upon us. Father, we also thank you for other things uh, coming up the, in this next week. Thank you for the different Bible studies that we get to participate in and know you better, draw near to you more in those, th in those things. Father, we thank you for, <clears throat> Lord, we think of Doug Trapp and as he's coming up toward a surgery here on his uh, other knee. We just pray that that would, would go well and that it was healed, uh, healed quickly and completely. Father, we continue to pray for Mary and her recovery, and thank you for the opportunity we have to be of some assistance to her this week and helping her with a few chores around the house. And Father, we just uh, pray that whatever this week holds, that uh, we're just thankful that you will walk with us through it. And we just pray that you'd help us to be uh, constantly aware of that throughout this coming week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it. Amen. Okay, let's all stand for the doxology as we uh, get ready to open the Word of God together. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you are, we're going to take out our Bibles, turn to the book of John, chapter 4. The very last part of John chapter 3 that followed the conversation with Nicodemus we covered when we were dealing with John the Baptist back at an earlier time, uh, back as we are going through chapter 1 of this book. So we're going to skip on over that, having done it already, and, and go to a, a second example of Christ uh, reaching out to people. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying... <clears throat> I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. You know, when we open up this passage this morning, we come to the the second of of the people that Jesus ends up in the lengthy conversation with. The first one we've looked at over the last couple weeks was Nicodemus. And when you look at Nicodemus and this woman from, from Samaria, you cannot hardly, you'd have to work hard to come up with two more opposite ends of the spectrum. Right, Nicodemus was a, Nicodemus was a person that he was in the social elite. He was respected among his people. This woman is uh, very disrespected. In fact, it says she comes in the sixth hour, more than likely counting from 6 a.m., the beginning of their morning. And so she's coming at noon. She's coming in the heat of the day. That's not the time when people would carry water. People would carry water in the cool of the evening, the cool of the morning. Not in the heat of the day. She's doing it in the heat of the day. She's also coming to a water source that's a little bit uh, farther out than other water sources that are in that area that she could have made available. So it looks like she's working pretty hard to be left alone is what it looks like. Probably not wanting to as you'd go at the time of, uh, uh, well, gathering water was considered women's work in, in, uh, in that culture. And so when uh, it came time for gathering water, the women would go out, take their jars and stuff, and go out to the wells and the springs and fill their waters and come back in. And you can imagine that as most of them are doing at the same time of day because it's nice and cool. And and, uh, so then it became kind of a socializing spot, right, as they're sharing the news of the day as they fill their pitchers and that kind of stuff and and then carry it back in. And, And this woman apparently didn't want to be any part of that. She was ostracized from that group. She was looked down upon from that group. And so she's coming in the heat of the day to a place farther out of town than the rest of the places to gather her water, uh, probably more than most likely just to be left alone. Well, Nicodemus was the other end of that spectrum. He was the, the rabbi that everybody wanted to hear his point of view on everything and to listen to and to greet. And, and so he was a part of the social elite in his place. He's a Jewish person, 100%. Where she's a kind of a mixed race, the 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 Samaritans, and we'll get into it a little bit farther in in, but they were kind of a half Jew, half Gentile, uh, um, up in that area, and so the, and they were heavily looked down on by the Jewish people, and and so he was of the more of the favored race, and she was of of more of a uh, would be second class, you'd say, because of her upbringing, because of her because of her heritage. Well. She's despised, he's respected, he's, you know, just about in every class. He's somebody that's worked very hard to try to have a spotless life, to be acceptable before God, and she has lived a life um, bathed in immorality, and has been her experience. But you know what the interesting thing is? When you look, there are some other differences that are in there as well. Nicodemus came to Jesus with a question, because he had some nagging question on his mind, Both were confronted by Christ, but Nicodemus came to Jesus. You know what? Jesus went to her. Nicodemus comes to him in the the night, probably so he could have an exclusive interview with Christ, and Jesus goes out of his way to go tracking down to her. And it kind of, you know, it reminds me of uh, several years ago, about 30, about 30 years ago, there became a real kind of a push within Christianity, within churches, to have what the, they called a seeker-sensitive service. To where they, they, they figured there's a whole bunch of people out there that are just are seeking God, that, that would like a relationship with God, but they just maybe don't know how to have it. Um, people that are, that are looking for something, but the church isn't giving the question, the, the answers to it, or, or isn't uh, formatting it in the right way. So they decided to have kind of a push toward 
um, making everything that's happening inside the church more palatable to them. Let's start doing some things inside the church that uh, the lost people outside the church will be attracted to and will maybe want to come and listen to or come and, come and sing those kinds of songs and different things and started really kind of aiming at this seeker-sensitive kind of a service. Now, to be honest, it never really resonated with me. I, I thought, you know, I, I totally want to reach everybody that we can reach and that kind of thing. But you know what? When we're coming and gathering together, we're gathering together to worship and when we gather together to worship and know God, then it seems like we ought to be more concerned about what God thinks than about what the average person on the street thinks about it. And so I thought, I'm not just, just not sure that we're hitting at it from the right perspective uh, in, that, in that way. Even within that, if you're, if you're going to try to make yourself appealing to people that don't have the Holy Spirit inside and don't have that tempering their delights and things, then I think you could get yourself in a lot of trouble the other the other problem i had with it was uh even maybe more of a theological one or a biblical one and that's uh when you look at romans romans chapter 3 verses 10 11 says as it is written none is righteous no not one no one understands no one seeks for god and so i found myself a little bit perplexed on how to look at this i said you know what the bible tells me that nobody seeks for god in and of their own flesh but actually the Bible says that we have to be drawn to God. So in other words, it's actually God seeking us that takes place. God drawing us to himself. And so I thought, you know what, when I look at trying to draw people, then, you know, obviously we're supposed to try to reach out to them with the gospel, but it's really God that has to, God that has to draw them. So, so is there anybody that you can legitimately call a seeker if the Bible says nobody seeks after God? But at the same time, at the same time, there are statements about Christ, like in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, where it says the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so, you know, responding to the gospel is really not about us seeking God, it's about God seeking us. The gospel is all about Jesus entering into our world, He coming to us, Him seeking us out for salvation. Him working in our hearts to draw us to Himself. It's, it's, actually, it's actually Him that's doing the seeking as our Savior. And that's what we are seeing as we look at John chapter 4 here this morning. Is we're getting a good glimpse of our seeking Savior. Our seeking Savior. And you know what, just as we did when we kind of hit that conversation with Nicodemus, I found a... Uh, we found a lot of questions that were being answered in the conversation with Nicodemus, between Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, I would say as we look at this conversation between Jesus and this woman at the well, we don't even know her name, it's just that's where she was, she was at the well. We see some other questions being answered as well. And the first question that comes up is, who's seeking who? You know, it's really not, when we look at that, I, I think there is something that makes us think that we're seeking God and you know what it is I think it's uh I think it's that we recognize that there's something missing in our life when we don't have him there's something that's supposed to be there you know the Bible says that God has put eternity in the hearts of man and so there's this longing there's this, some people call it like a like a God-shaped hole that only God can fill and we'll get a little bit farther into that here in just a few moments but but um uh and so when we recognize the absence of things, then we start trying a lot of, of something. We start trying a lot of things. And, and that's what this woman had been doing. And so you, maybe you could call her a seeker in the, sense, in the sense that she's probably recognizing that there's something missing in her life. And she's trying to find a way to fill that void like all people do. But it's actually Jesus who is seeking her. Now, as Jesus comes up, the, the passage starts out with Jesus saying he's going to go from where? He's going to go from down in Judea, which is the region down around Jerusalem. He's going to go from there up to Galilee, which is up north. Right in between Judea and Galilee is Samaria. Big, big section right in the middle. Now, there's three different paths that you can take to get to Samaria. You can follow the coast and go out by the Mediterranean Sea and come up. You can go over into Perea, over across the Jordan River and come up that side which would take you into Gentile land, or you can go right up through Samaria, which would take you right through the land of the Samaritans and get up, and get up there. Now, 
When you look at the map, you'd say, well, Jesus says, I've got to go through Samaria. Well, of course you would. Uh, right? The closest distance between any two points is a straight line. And the only straight line goes right through Samaria. But you know what? The Jews wouldn't even see it that way. The Jews would much rather take the coastline. They would even rather go through Perea into Gentile territory than go into Samaritan territory. Why do they hate the Samaritans so bad? Well, they had quite a history with the Samaritans. It goes all the way back to when the nation of Israel split. After, David, remember David was made king, and then the first king was Saul, and then David replaced him. God replaced Saul with a man after his own heart, which was David. He was a good king. And then Solomon was a king that, he was the son of David, and he followed David. Well, after Solomon died, and he was the wisest king in the history of the world, after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. And when Rehoboam became king, uh, the ten northern tribes, right, there's 12 tribes of Israel total. Two of them were in the southern part of, of Israel in Judea. And the ten northern tribes encompassed the rest of Israel. Well, the ten northern tribes came down, sent representatives down to Rehoboam, and they asked him. They said, you know what, your, your father Solomon was pretty hard on us. He was, if you just lighten the load, just relax a little bit, we will serve you gladly. But if you don't relax a little, then we don't even feel like part of the nation. Well, Rehoboam decided to get some advice. So he goes to the guys that had counseled his father, the older guys. And the older guys told him, you know what? Your dad was pretty hard on him. Do it. Relax. Take it easy on him. They'll, you'll, they'll serve you faithfully. You'll have no problems. And then he turned to the guys that were his age. And with the guys that were his age, he says, what should I do? And they, were, and they said, tell them, tell them this. Tell them, my dad's, my, my pinky is going to be stronger than my dad's thigh. Right, your thigh, I believe it's, I think it's the biggest muscle in your body. And his little finger. He says, my dad's pinky is going to, my pinky is going to be bigger than my dad's thigh. In other words, what is he telling them? I don't know who you are, I think you are coming before the king like this, but you haven't seen anything yet. And so they said, well, then what do we have to do with Israel? And they left and they split the nation. And a guy named Jeroboam became the king of the northern tribes and they called that Israel. And Saul, uh, Rehoboam remained king of the southern tribes and they called that Judah. And so he just had Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes. At first he was going to go after him in battle and God told him not to. So he just let there be the split. Now, both nations had trouble, right? The, the ten northern tribes, they fell into worshiping other gods they intermarried with the people around them and worshiped other gods and ended up getting carried off into captivity up into syria in about the year 722 bc well the two southern tribes they were slower at falling into that bad stuff but they nevertheless caught up eventually and so at about i think it was about 580 bc they got carried off into captivity over east into babylon they were in captivity for 70 years and then they were allowed to come home and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and get things going again. The ten northern tribes, the ten northern tribes never really came back. We kind of refer to them as the lost tribes of Israel today. But you did have what you ended up with was in their captivity, they didn't stay separate. In the captivity that went into Babylon, you read about people like, like Daniel. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, people that would not give up their distinctiveness, would, would be, remain faithful to God and, and remain their, faithful to their heritage. Not so much with the ten northern tribes. And so that whole area up north ended up becoming a very Jew and Gentile mix, kind of a spiritual half-breed, physical half-breed kind of a thing all at the same time. And so the people that had stayed faithful in the southern part of the kingdom they looked at the people of Samaria as like almost worse than the Gentiles. Because these were not just people that were Gentiles by birth. These were people that were unfaithful to God and intermixed with the pagans and, and with their worship and everything. And so they looked at them as worse than the enemy, but traitors. And so they really, really hated them. Well, what happens is, when Israel, when the nation split... A guy named Jeroboam that was leading the ten northern tribes, he got nervous. He said, you know what, they have the temple down there, and if our people keep going down to worship in the temple, 
they're going to end up visiting with the people down there and they're going to end up with their hearts back as one and the nation is going to come back together and then he's going to kill me and uh, it's not going to go well for me. In 1 Kings chapter 12, it says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David if this people go up and offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Should have learned about that from back in the days of Moses, right? But he did it anyway. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan, he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah. And he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did it in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. And he went up to the altar and he had, that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel and went up to the altar to make offerings. And so you see what happens is he's worried. He says, if they keep going down to the temple and worshiping, the nation's going to come back together and I'm going to be killed and I'll lose my kingdom. And so what does he do? He says, you know what, you guys, the days of having to travel all the way down to Jerusalem are over. And he just appointed different high places. He says, you, know, we're gonna, you can worship here or you can worship here. Hey, we're going to put priests at these places. We're going to build temples at these places. You can offer sacrifices at these places. What is he doing? He's just making it convenient. He's saying, look, you guys don't travel down to Jerusalem anymore for those. He, they invented their own holidays. They're going to put our holiday on the same. Oh, happy. The other guys happen to have a holiday too, but we got our own holiday to celebrate. So we don't need to go down there to celebrate the holiday with them. And so their own holiday, their own priests, their own temples, their own... All that stuff, and that's with the dividing of the nation and keeping them separate. And then that's what ended up leading to the Samaritan people. You ended up with this group above that were intermarried with the other peoples, and, and thus you have this, the, the beginning of the Samaritan people. Well, in, in Ezra, because what happens later is that when, when Judah gets to come back out of the Babylonian captivity and come back to Israel, when they come back to Jerusalem, they're going to rebuild the temple. And you know what happens? The Samaritans, they want to help. They want to help with it. And we find in Ezra chapter 4, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that he, re that he returned exiles, or that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses, and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Ezahadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And so what happens is, the, the, Ju the people of Judah get to come back out of their captivity. The people of Samaria had mixed with the pagan gods and all that stuff at first. But then uh, pretty soon they got to where they were just worshiping God, but in their own way, kind of an idea, and in their own place. And then when they came back to rebuild the temple, they came down and said, hey, we've been worshiping your God. We've been worshiping the same God for all this time. Let us help you. Let us come back and help refurbish the temple and worship with you. Now, kind of like what it's saying is, look, we're all worshiping the same God, just doing it in different ways. Let's work together. And the people of Israel said, no, we're not doing that. And so then what happens is, if you read farther through the story, is that they start trying to discourage them. They start making fun of them. They, they start uh, threatening at, attacks. In fact, when you get to the book of Nehemiah, when you get to the Nehemiah, now a guy named Sambalat, it says that he, when he heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly in, in, enraged and he jeered at the Jews and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, 
What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they, will they receive, revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? And the burned ones at that. And he's saying, are they really going to rebuild that? They can't rebuild that mess. In other words, since they didn't let them participate, now they're, they're trying to discourage them and they're trying to stop the work. In fact, if you read a little bit farther there, you find that, that they start making threats. They, they go petition the king to try to get the king to stop them from doing the work. They threaten them so that at time, during Nehemiah's time, sometimes they'll have somebody on guard standing there with a weapon and somebody else with a trowel while they rebuild the walls. Other times they'd have a trowel in one hand and a weapon in the other while they're, while they're working but because they were being threatened by the Samaritans. So kind of to make a long story short, Samaritans were a group that kind of intermingled with the people around them, were less faithful. And so they were looked down on, looked at as traitors by their people. And then when the people came back to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans wanted to meld back together. And they were denied. And so they became very bitter enemies. And they hated one another because of it. That's why you see things like in Luke chapter 9, in verses 51 through 53, it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now this is Jesus, and he's, he's moving from the north country down through to Jerusalem. So again, he's going through Samaria, and he get, he's, he's headed down that way. Now notice what it says. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him, but the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus is traveling. He's just, head, just getting started into Samaria, heading down through there. He sends a few disciples ahead to buy provisions and, and get stuff that they needed for the trip. And when they got down there, they found out Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Nope, if you're on your way to Jerusalem, we're not going to help you. You can't buy anything here. You know, so that's, a, that's kind of the hate that they had for him. You see the hate going the other way. In John chapter 8, and verse 48, it says, The Jews answered him, talking to, about Jesus when, when Jesus reached out to Zacchaeus. He says, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And so they, they looked at the Samaritans as being demon-possessed. In fact, we found writing from like A.D. 66 where the, the Jewish rabbis taught that uh, the Samaritan women were like um, forever uh, unclean because, you know, there's an unclean during the monthly cycle. They said they're perpetually on that cycle. They're unclean all the time. Another uh, writing from back at that time referred to uh, the people in Samaria as those stupid people from Shechem. And so the, there's this real animosity between the Jewish and the Gentile, or the, the Samaritan people. And so... When this woman of Samaria, when Jesus says, give me a drink of water. And she's like, what, what are you doing asking me for a drink? An Orthodox Jewish people would, person would never ask a Samaritan for a drink of water. Why? Because the very cup that is owned by a Samaritan will pollute you if you drink from it. And so... She's astounded. Jesus is breaking all kinds of cultural, cultural norms. There's a man that's talking to a woman. Husbands often wouldn't even talk to their wives in public. He's a, he's a Jewish person asking for, from a Samaritan person. But you know, here's the interesting thing. Here you got this woman with her heritage and her background and everything. She's somebody that's very shunned within society. You know, Jesus goes out of his way to meet her. Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? It's not because it was the shortest distance between two points. He needs to go to Samaria because he wants to go to that well because he knows that woman is going to be there. And that's, that's who he wants. That's who he's seeking. You know, Nicodemus, with all the social qualifications and all the biblical understanding and all the heritage, the right heritage and the right group and the right this and that, Jesus goes out of his way to go to the woman of Samaria. Who's seeking who? That's the question. Clearly, Jesus is seeking her. In fact, later in the same passage, and we find that he tells her the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking 
such people to worship him. You see, she's, she's not a seeker. She's just lost. Christ is the one seeking. Do you know what? It was the same with me. I wasn't seeking. He was the one seeking me. It's the same thing with you. It's the same thing with every case. Christ, is, remember last week we talked about who is this who is this being born again experience for with Nicodemus? And we said it's for the world because Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's proving that right here. Not only does it go to Nicodemus and the religious leaders, or should be, it is also it is for everybody. Well, then there's a second question that begs from the passage, and that is, which one is thirsty? Who's the thirsty one? Because Jesus is, in his humanity, obviously, he's parched. He gets hungry, he gets thirsty, and he comes there and he's, it's hot, it's the middle of the day, and he sends the disciples ahead to go get food, and Jesus says to this woman, give me a drink. And she says, why would, why would I give you a drink? And what does he say? He says, if you would have known who it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you the living water. And she says, well, what are you going to draw with? That well is like 100 feet deep, that well. In fact, it's the deepest well known to the area. It's a pretty awesome thing when you think about it. She'd been drinking, they'd been drinking out of that well for like 2,000 years from the time of, of Abraham till then. And so this, uh, this well has a lot of heritage for them. It's a pretty awesome spot. Well, Jesus comes to her, and actually, you know, it's an amazing thing too. She's the first person that he just openly proclaims who he is to her. She's the first person that he tells, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Christ. She's the first one that he opens up to in that way. But as, as he, he says, you would have asked me and I would give you the living water. Now she's like, well, what are you going to, what are you going to draw with? The well's deep. Where can I get this living water? And, he's, and he says, look, if you drink from this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But if you drink from the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. You see what it's talking about is it's talking about a satisfaction. You know, without Christ in our life, there's a, there's a dissatisfaction. Right? It's like, it's, like there's a, it's like there's a thirst that is never quenched. It's like there's a hunger that's never satisfied. And we don't really know when we're lost in that condition. We don't really know what's causing that. We don't really know. We don't understand that God has put eternity in the hearts of man. And so we, we start to fill it with other things. We start to fill it with hobbies. We fill it with possessions. We fill it with, uh, we fill it with money. We fill it with relationships. We fill it with work. We fill it with drugs or alcohol. We, there's something missing. There's something that we're thirsty for. There's something that we're hungry for, but we don't know what it is. And so maybe we even try a lot of those things. Bounce from one thing to another to another. For this woman, it was relationships, clearly. Because when Jesus tells her, go get your husband and bring him, bring him to me. And then we'll talk about it some more. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Obviously, there's something lacking here. There's a void that she's trying to fill. There's a, there's a thirst that she, that she hasn't been able to satisfy. And Jesus says, you're at the right place. Or at least you're with the right person. I'm going to give you that thing that's missing. I'm going to satisfy that thirst. You know, this is not a new concept to them. Psalm chapter 36 and verse 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. In Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, he says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We talked even last week with Nicodemus. We talked about how Jesus used water with Nicodemus as well, being born of the water, even the spirit. And, and used water as an analogy of that spiritual life that would take place within him when he entered into the new birth now with the woman at the well he's doing the same thing he's saying look that water in you will will turn into a fountain 
flowing. What is, what is a fountain but an excess of water? What is a fountain but, but whatever is holding it has more than it needs and it just flows out all over the place? That's the, that's the whole point. You know, when we think of Psalm 23, Psalm 23 starts off with, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the main theme of the whole chapter there. Because I have such a great shepherd, I will not be in want. I have what I need. I, can, I, will, I am totally satisfied. That's what he's saying. Then he keeps up with the analogy. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That's how a shepherd gets the sheep what they need. And David is writing this and saying, you know what, the Lord is my shepherd. David had spent many years shepherding sheep. He knew how to provide for the sheep. He says, you know who my shepherd is? My shepherd is the Lord. And because I have such a great shepherd, I don't want for anything. Well, a little bit farther down in the passage, when we get to verse 5, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What is he saying? He's saying, God, because you're my shepherd, I've submitted to you. I have all that I need and more. I'm overflowing. So is David satisfied in his life? Satisfied in his relationship with God? Yes. Why? Because Christ is satisfying. He is ultimately satisfying. You know, I remember the day I invited Christ into my life. And... I'm not saying that you don't have up days and down days and that kind of stuff, but, but my life has been full of satisfaction. Never for a moment have I regretted putting my faith in Christ. Never for a moment have I been dissatisfied with God since the moment that I believed in Him. He is very satisfying. You know, even when you look toward the end times, He continues to use this analogy of water to describe how satisfying the kingdom of God is. It says when the day of the Lord comes in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 8, it says on that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea, and it shall continue summer as winter. And then when you get up to the, like the book of Revelation in chapter 7 and verse 17, it says, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Just gives this picture of our eternal state with God, being us being completely satisfied with everything that we have in God. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6, as you get right toward the end of the book of Revelation, he's going to say basically the same thing twice. It says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Chapter 22, verse 17, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without payment price and so you know what all through the bible even up into the end times it uses this analogy of water and and what is and and it quenching our thirst and satisfying our longings that we will put our faith in christ and live for christ that we are satisfied in him because again he is ultimately satisfying but you know what the problem is the problem is we try to satisfy it with so many lesser gods and they never satisfy. They never satisfy. Everything always, every experience needs another. Look at all the different addictions that are out there in this world. Why are they addictions? Because this little thing that you did when you first tried it doesn't stay satisfying. And so you get to a point where you're in bondage to it and still trying to heighten the experience by more and more or more powerful and more powerful or bigger and bigger or more perverted and more perverted. But whatever that is, it just grows. Why? Because those are, and those are signs of being outside of the kingdom of God. Why? Because if you're inside the kingdom of God, you're satisfied in Christ and you don't need those things. You know, even back in the Old Testament days, in the days of Jeremiah, in chapter 2 and verse 13 of his book, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Notice the comparison of those two things. What would they have in God? In God, he says, the fountain of living waters. All you can have and more, continually fresh. 
right? That's the whole point of a, a flowing stream or a, a running brook or a, 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 a shooting fountain. It's always fresh water, why? Because it's on the move, bringing new all the time. But they've traded it for what? Cisterns. Cisterns, what is that? Sitting water. You fill it and then there it sits until you use it. And while it's sitting, what is it doing? Well, it's getting warmer, starting to stagnate, right? You leave it long enough, can have a little green stuff floating on the top. And he's saying, you know what? You've traded the clear running overabundance of a fountain for a cistern, and not even a good cistern, a cistern with holes in it that leaks. He says, that's, that's what you've done. That's what he told the people of his day. In chapter 17 of Jeremiah also, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. And you know what? We have the same choice before us today because not only was it written for Old Testament Israel, but when we get to John chapter 7, we're going to learn in depth of another experience of Jesus when he walks into the temple. It's going to be at a time when they have this little ceremony where they celebrate the living water. And on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water water you know as we look at this passage jesus asked her for water because he was thirsty but which one was really thirsty she was she'd been drinking from that stagnant cistern for too long and she needed something but she didn't know what it was and Jesus, through the course of this conversation, guides her to exactly what she needs, which is Him. She begins to question Him about the temple. And to be honest, it's, I didn't know if that was to... I thought a lot of times, I still don't know, because it's kind of like, you know, it's like reading a text. I made up my mind years ago never to do anything important with a text. Send little messages, meet me here, this kind of thing, whatever. Don't have an ongoing discussion because there's no change in your voice. There's no facial expressions. There's no body language. Wrote a, we were involved in an email one time that was taken in a way that it was not meant. And, and uh, I, from that point, I said, you know what? No more of that. <laughs> no, no more. If, if there's something uh, touchy or anything important, we're dealing with it in a different way. It's going to be a, at least a phone call, if not in person. And because when you read through this, you know, there's a little bit of that. Right? Because Jesus, he confronts her for her sin, and then all of a sudden she's talking about a religious thing. You know, do you worship here or do you worship there? And before I thought, well, that was just a smoke screen to kind of get off the subject of her sin. But I'm not, so, I'm not so sure anymore. As I studied out this passage more, I thought, well, maybe she's opening up to Christ here, and maybe that, that is an issue that they, that they would deal with. And so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly how to take all of it, but one point that is clear as we, as we look within the passage is that uh, Jesus then leads her in the process of bringing her to himself. What does he do? He confronts her sin. And that answers the question, who is the sinner? Well, obviously she is. Because Jesus, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Because in our day, in a lot of churches, if that woman came down the aisle at a church or went up to a pastor or somebody afterwards and said, you know what, I'm, I need something in my life. I need, I need, I'm lacking. I'm thirsting for something. I need that in my life. That's often a point where we'd say, okay, well, that's, that's great. Maybe show them a couple Bible verses. Repeat after me. Let's say this prayer. You know what? Jesus doesn't do that. What does Jesus do? He you knows she's not at that point yet. What does he do? He says, go get your husband. Bring him back. Why? Because you can't turn and embrace Christ without turning away from your sin. It's just... It's like oil and water. They don't mix. You have to let go of the one to, to cleave to the other. You can't, you can't put your faith in Christ and live in your sin. It's just it's, it's oxymoronic at least. You know, I think of uh, Jeremiah again. He's a popular guy today, even though we're studying the book of John apparently. But in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, God tells them this. He says, you steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely, 
make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered only to go on doing all these abominations. He's looking at the life of the Israelites at that point and he says you know what he says you guys sin all week long and then you come in Sunday and you sing your praises of me and then you walk back out and you do it all over again. What's his point? Is that really what this is all about? Is that really satisfactory? The answer is no. You see that's that's exactly what Jesus what this woman needs is not to tack more religion onto her life. What she needs is repentance and faith. That's what she needs. She was getting to the point where she's like, I'm, you seem like a prophet. Let me ask you a question. We're told we're supposed to worship here. Remember that the nation dividing and building the other altars? When they got rejected from helping build the temple in Jerusalem, they went and built a temple on Mount Gerizim, said, fine, we'll build our own temple, we'll do it ourselves. She said, now, between those two temples, now there's the one in Jerusalem that got rebuilt, and there's the one at Gerizim that we worship at. We say we worship here, you say we should worship down there. Which is it? Well, she asked it at the one point in history where it really doesn't matter. And he's not really saying it doesn't matter, he's saying it's changing. He says, look, the Jewish people are right. Salvation's of the Jews. That's the temple that you worship at. What they were doing was wrong. But he said, you know what? Right now, it's changing. Why? Because a greater than the temple was here. A greater than Jerusalem is here. A greater than Gerizim is here. And so Jesus is the truth. He is that temple, as we've already talked about. He is the way that we worship God. And so Jesus is God tabernacling, templing among us. And so it was very rapidly coming to the point where the temple wasn't going to be needed anymore. It's going to fade off the scene because we have the Christ. We have the true dwelling of God with man in Christ. And so that's what he does. He points her to himself. But he can't do that without helping her shed her sin. And then lastly... And that brings us right into what we were just talking about there. Who is the Savior? She finally recognizes and she says, you know what? I know that there's coming this Messiah who's called the Christ. And when he comes, he's going to teach us all things. And Jesus just tells her plainly. Tells her plainly. I'm that guy. And she puts her faith in him. You know what? In these two stories, the story of Nicodemus... And the story of this woman at the well, we see two very different ends of, the, of many different spectrums. The point is Jesus is seeking them all. He is our seeking Savior. He's the one that comes after us. And you know what? We all, everyone does that same thing. They... There's a dissatisfaction that is built into who we are until we come to Christ. Nicodemus tried to fill that emptiness with Bible knowledge, with social clout, with moving up the ladder among the religious leaders of the day. The woman at the well tried to fill that longing with relationships, one broken relationship after another broken relationship. Many people try to fill it with many other different things. But you know what? In any of those things, there's not one of those things that will bring satisfaction. There's not one of those things that will quench that thirst. They'll only cause a greater thirst. The only thing that will provide that satisfaction is the man that the woman met at the well that day is Jesus Christ. It's only in faith in Him that we can be satisfied. Our Father, we're thankful. We're thankful that Your Son, our Savior, came seeking us. And Father, we're thankful that there is a longing within us that can only be satisfied in Him. 
And Father, we are grateful that at the moment that we do set down those other things that we pursue and put our faith in Christ, that he is deeply satisfying. Father, thank you as we would testify with David that our cup overflows. And we know that when you come and set up your kingdom, it will be a kingdom overflowing with living water. Overflowing with ultimate satisfaction. And Father, we're so thankful that we can find our satisfaction in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it. Amen.